My name is Dr. Huda Unas. I am a general practitioner in uh, Harley Street in uh, London. I've been practicing as a GP since 2013. About 30% of my work is in mental health. This is partly because I'm also trained in psychotherapy in certain modalities called schema therapy, which is focused on emotional health and uh, um, problems that might happen before a person becomes mentally ill, such as issues with abandonment, social isolation, imposter syndrome, before they become actual mental health problems, such as anxiety, depression, the um, usual diagnosable uh, ones. I'm also trained in complex emotional trauma, which is problems that might have happened in early childhood and a person has never particularly or completely overcome uh, them and they are now manifesting in adulthood. I hold a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, a membership to the Royal College of General Practitioners, a fellowship to the Royal College of Australian General Practitioners, because I've trained over there as well as uh, here, I'm duly qualified, and a diploma in uh, occupational medicine. I think many of you here uh, are um, working and of working age, so probably occupational health is actually an important part of our health, how healthy we are at work. I've trained and do practice aesthetic medicine as well, anti-aging medicine. I've led projects for the United Nations, one on uh, mental health and making it accessible to more people in the world, and two projects for the British government. One was on access to primary care, was called Right Choice First Time, which is how to um, make the right choice the first time you are seeking the medical help, such as do you go to a &E, do you go to the GP, do you go to an urgent care center? And the second project was on ophthalmology uh, services. Uh, I am also a Media Link doctor and I'm a regular commentator on TV, radio and print outlets. Just last week, I've had an article in the Times on alcohol. We will talk a bit about that on the section on toxins and uh, uh, optimizing our health. I'm a health educator as well. I train doctors who want to become general practitioners. We call them GP regis. So I'm approved by Health Education England to train them. And I've done several international presentations in the UK, Spain, Japan, Australia, and recently in the United Arab Emirates in December. I don't know when will my next international <laughs> talk be now in the uh, days of COVID, who knows? So now let's go into the meaty stuff. So I'm going to talk for probably about half an hour and then I'm going to stop and open the floor so you can ask me questions. I've got loads of extra slides. If you want to learn more on the theory, just ask, but I'm going to stick to the first half, which is the one that would be of interest to most people, general health. And then if there's any particular area you would like me to go into in more depth, I'm here. So pillars of health. Nutrition, of course, you are what you eat. If you eat well, you are not going to really develop diseases. You are going to uh, be uh, in good health, of a good um, body weight, mentally alert. So nutrition is important. I think you all know that. Movement, uh, my tip on movement would be that movement isn't just exercise as in formal exercise. Everything counts. Even the little steps you do when you are walking to work, even some walk in the park, some work you do at home if you're hoovering or gardening that also counts as movement and is healthy because we're getting our joints to move, we're getting some activity for our heart. Sleep is very important, especially for those who want to lose weight. Did you know, for example, that uh, if you don't sleep well, you release more of the hormone leptin, which actually makes you feel more hungry and hence make worse choices during the day in terms of uh, what you eat. So there are patients who actually lose weight solely by fixing their sleep, because if you sleep well, you have seven to nine hours, depends on what is actually right for you, then you release the right hormones, you eat better during the day, you regenerate overnight and produce new cells, and hence you are not just in a mode where your body thinks you're under a lot of stress and you should be 
um, we might be in a starvation mode and you should be saving calories and hence not burning fat. Avoidance of toxin is next. We will talk about that in details. And by toxins, I mean usually alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine. How much is really um, dangerous? How much is actually okay? And how to drink healthily um, any of uh, um, this, either the caffeine or uh, alcohol. Tobacco, I would never recommend to anyone. There's no healthy minimum in tobacco. There's just no tobacco. <laughs> Mental health and emotional health. These are two different things, by the way. Mental health is more to do with thoughts and emotional health more on emotions. And we'll talk about that uh, later on. Occupational health is health at work. Is your work a healthy space or is it actually making you not well or making you even ill, unfortunately, sometimes? Living with chronic illnesses for people who already have them, such as asthma, hay fever, anything, how to live with it healthily. It's also a pillar of health, adapting to that illness, maximizing your well-being and living despite it, preventing its prolapses and problems. So let's talk about tips there. then. We call this presentation 10 tips for optimizing your health and then minimize it to just tips, but I am actually gonna give you 10 anyway. So. I know for certain that most of you at A Small World are highly educated people. I met some of you in some of the London events. I'm sure you don't want to hear me saying, do some exercise and reduce your calories. You already know that. So I am going to do this in a bit more modern and proactive way and actually share with you some progressive medical knowledge that we actually know now works and things that are actually practical. So tip one is actually time. This actually is one of the reasons that I hear most from my patients when they are not living healthily and I ask them, why aren't you exercising? Why aren't you preparing your meals or so? This is the main reason that I usually hear most people say, I just I simply don't have the time. So what I say is schedule time to focus on your health. How you use that time is up to you. But it might be, for example, on a Sunday, you sit with yourself and you say in your diary, two sessions a week for my health. You might use them as gym sessions. You might use them as walks or connecting with nature. You might use them for weekly journaling, which is a good thing for mental health or for those who are trying to overcome a breakup or some difficulty at work or difficulty with family, then journaling is definitely a method of restoring our mental health. Periodic digital detox is a very good idea, which is every now and again going on a break from digital products, not using our phone, not going on Instagram. It might be actually a good idea. In fact, some scientists even recommend a digital Saba, which is one day a week where you just simply don't log into any digital devices at all and take a complete break from them. Schedule this time, don't leave it to chance because if you leave it to chance, life happens and you will lose track. And then before you know it, things didn't happen this week, you didn't go to the gym, next week is the same, the same and the same. And then it just becomes a cumulative effect. Tip two is space. I'm keeping these tips very simple, but at the same time, sophisticated, where we can actually fit in more of those uh, pillars of health uh, in every one of these tips. For example, with time, we can use it for nutrition to prepare our meals, and meal prep is a proven method of actually eating well when we know what we are eating, taking our time to prepare it and measure the portions and make sure they are all okay. You can use it for movement. You can use the time to sleep well. So all of them will be actually applicable to more than just one pillar of health. So time, space, make sure your space and environment is actually healthy and friendly. For example, some people who experience sleep difficulties, the, one of the first things I start with my patients on a health screening when they have sleep difficulties is ask about their environment. What is happening in your environment? Are there lights from the street? Can you do simple things such as wear a mask at night? Is it noise potentially? Can you invest in something that isolates your room from uh, the noise? Is there a way of moving the bed in a certain way that it's not directly facing the street lights? It's things like that, actually making sure our space and environment serves our health. Space to exercise as well is a good idea to have a home studio. You don't have space for it, especially, say, in 
London, we don't have much space at all in our small houses and studios, it might be a good idea to keep things, say, like a kettlebell in the kitchen, for example, and every time you're waiting for the kettle to burn, you can grab the kettlebell and do some small or gentle exercises, but make your space work for you, make it work for health. Three, mental health. With this one, actually mental health is obviously a very vast topic, same as physical health. And there are so many things that could potentially, uh, we could potentially do. What I would say is that my top tip for mental health is that it's not a one size fits all. For example, some patients tell me things like, oh, doctor, I can't really do any more therapy because therapy simply doesn't work for me. I have tried it and uh, it doesn't work to which I say therapy works for everyone. If it doesn't work, it's because it either wasn't the right modality for you, the right type, the right therapist. For people who don't have the time or cannot commit to therapy sessions, then you can do meditations. Also, some people say meditation doesn't work for me, doctor, I've tried it. And I say, try a different type of meditation. There are now so many apps that we can use. There's the Calm app, there's Mind Shine, there's Headspace. There's some of them that now even sub-specialize. There's one called Slumber that specializes in sleep. There's one that specializes in pregnancy, which I think is all great that we have all these methods. If you're more of a physical type person and like to deal with your mental health by moving your body, then there is things like yoga that you can do even major exercise such as resistance training is very good as well for uh, releasing happy hormones on dolphins though actually i've got some reservation on that i think it's good for physical health for mental health yes exercise releases happy hormones but is not an alternative to dealing with the root cause of the mental health problem so what I mean by that is that exercise can also be used as a distraction. So same as alcohol or anything that makes you not think about the problem. If you have, for example, a difficult situation at work, then exercising it away will not really work. It will make you feel temporarily better and calms down your nervous system, but it's not going to solve the actual situation. To solve the situation, we have to solve the root cause of it, the actual problem, say the difficult relationship with the colleague or with our boss, or potentially uh, uh, write about it in journaling, talk about it in therapy or with your support bubbles. So these are superior methods in terms of mental health than exercise. Exercise is good, but is not the best thing there is. After all, mental health is about thoughts and the thoughts need to be expressed. It cannot be um, the work cannot be delegated to our physical body to carry the weight of the mental or emotional body's work. Which takes me to the next point where I said emotional health is not the same as mental health. Emotional health is about our feelings, mental health is about our thoughts. For example, anxiety, depression, stress are mental health problems because they alter our thought processes as well. Abandonment issues, vulnerability to harm, even entitlement, some of the really difficult ones that nobody wants to really admit to having, but are usually discovered in um, therapy, people pleasing, all of these are more emotional health issues. And the way that I dealt with is different. This is a bit more sophisticated and complex work. But for example, with mental health, you might be better off going to CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy and talk about your thought processes and the therapist will help you organize them. Whereas with mental health, it might be better seeing a schema therapist or someone like me who will deal with it more from an emotion or heart perspective that we can write a diary together, we can do a journal, we can recall things that have happened in childhood, we can do some imagery work, which is we reimagine your childhood and then bring you as an adult into that picture or me as therapist into that picture. It's very interesting work, but the reason I am saying all that about mental health and emotional health is for you not to despair ever. If you're actually feeling not right mentally or emotionally, you're experiencing difficult thoughts or difficult emotions, please never give up on yourself or think, I'm a hopeless case, nothing has worked for me, I went to therapy twice and still feel the same, the exercise is not helping me. It's not you, it just 
just means it's not the right method for you yet. I use here the analogy in mental health with physical health. In physical health, you can't say, I'm vomiting, so I'm gonna take an asthma inhaler, and they say, oh, the inhaler hasn't worked. Of course, the inhaler works on the respiratory system, on our breathing. It does not work on the digestive system, and your symptoms are different. They are digestive, we need to find the right method for them. So same in mental health. If you're depressed, but had treatment that would have been possibly more for suitable for stress or for anxiety, then it's not your depression that's resistant to treatment. It just means that treatment was for the wrong thing and maybe you could benefit from something different. But there are so many things out there in the market. There are so many mental health exercises, meditation types, therapies, drugs. The only thing that's not an option is to actually live with poor mental health because we have this one life and we don't have to actually put up with the bad mental health. This is possibly the main tip I would give you in this whole presentation, but there's more golden tips to come anyway, so please stay tuned. Let's see, nutrition, review your diet honestly and implement changes because, okay, everybody knows that five portions of fruit and veg a day, we should eat, eat more whole grain, we should try and reduce our content of red meat. Everyone knows that. I'm sure everyone here in the audience, if I asked you about nutrition, you will probably be able to talk on it more than me. Everyone is educated on the subject, but how to actually implement changes is the challenge. I would say keep a diary, track yourself, make sure you're sleeping well so we're not releasing hormones during the day, making us make bad choices that we know are bad because it's not knowledge that fails people in terms of nutrition, it's more the will power. And that's more complex. It involves the other elements in as pillars of health like sleep, like movement because exercise releases cortisol as well, makes you think differently, feel hungry differently, crave different foods, mental health as well. If you go into anger mode, which in psychology is called angry child mode, you're gonna make the choices of an angry child. And what choices does an angry child have? Then an angry child has a default diet of, you know, McDonald's and burgers, and you will want these things because in that stage when you're feeling anger, then, when you are behaving like a four or five year old, then you're gonna make their choices. So all the other pillars fit in well together to help our nutrition. So don't assume that you know stuff because of course you do know. Focus on implementing the change. Digital health, unplug from computers every now and again, take breaks from them, periodic breaks like we talked about this Saba earlier. Also, another thing you can do is accounts that you follow on social media, make sure you don't follow anyone that makes you feel negative. Some of those, you know, really narcissistic accounts that go all like, oh, of course, I've run 7K before even breakfast. What have you done today? This is how, this is what 40 looks like. What do you look like in your 30s? And it's that sort of like statements where you get some celebrities that actually have this sense of like feeling good at the expense of making others feel bad. Sorry, I'm just gonna turn the lights on. So I have got some automatic lights that switch themselves on and off. Um, so yeah, any accounts that make you feel bad like that, please get rid of them. Anyone that promotes unhealthy behavior, also get rid of them, especially now there's the body positivity movement, which I'm actually writing pieces for that, working with uh, the brand Rebook, the sports brand on that, because body positivity has also been exploited by a lot of people to say things like, oh yeah, you are beautiful at any size. Mm, yes, no, I think, well, yeah, body positivity isn't gonna save you from having diabetes or all the complications of obesity or having a heart attack. Yes, of course, accept yourself and your body at any size, but definitely try to improve, except that also obesity is not the norm and is actually a 21st century problem other than uh, what we should uh, be accepting as uh, okay or put up with or love it because no we don't love obesity we love ourselves anyway and in any shape to an extent we want to change ourselves to the better not uh, put up with um whatever that's a very different concept it's been hijacked almost so family history 
please check your family history and consult your doctor as to what does this family history mean to you? Because some diseases are genetic or have a genetic element and some don't. Some of them will you will need surveillance or screenings or a referral to a geneticist, such as, let's take an example, colorectal cancer. There is colorectal cancer that's hereditary and there is colorectal cancer, or bowel cancer, that's non-hereditary. Same with heart disease. If someone in your family has had a heart attack or a stroke before age 60, then we do have a problem because there is a risk that this is a sign of familial high cholesterol and you need to get your cholesterol checked out. If, however, the person in your family has had a heart attack and they are over 70 at the time, then that's just the aging process. All of us, if we're lucky enough to live until then, we'll probably have heart attacks. So that's not something that will apply to you. Same with breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So please, if there's anything at all like that in your family, speak to a doctor and we will either reassure you that it's not genetic and you have nothing to worry about, or we will enter you into the correct uh, program, surveillance, screening, or refer you to the right people, right and relevant specialty, geneticist, colorectal surgeon, breast clinic, whatever is actually relevant for you. Seven health screening, which takes me to the next stage, a health checkup, 360 health checkup. I actually love these products. I offer them in my private clinic. I've offered them as well when I worked for other people before I set up independently. I worked for the NHS, obviously I still work for them um, occasionally doing emergency work as well as Nuffield Health and HCA, Health Corporation America, and we used to do screenings all the time there. In a health screening, you have a doctor, sometimes a doctor and a physiologist, and we will talk to you about all the pillars of health, the nutrition, the exercise, the sleep, stress, mental health, the family history, everything that I'm sharing with you now, guys, is what you would normally get in a health screening. And then you get a physical examination, some blood tests. So the advice is personalized to you. The NHS offers health screenings for people aged to 40 to 74. I know we all would love to have a health screening uh, younger than that. But unfortunately, the NHS has uh, limited resources, so we cannot offer them to everyone. And I think it's a shame because sometimes it's good to learn about our health earlier. For example, there are things that I think if some of my patients didn't come in for health screening, they would have never known. Say if you are a young woman, you want to learn about fertility or freezing your eggs or which hormones to do or the HPV vaccine, which did you know, ladies, by the way, you can get HPV vaccine up to age 47. Privately, of course, not on the NHS. On the NHS, uh, it's only for teenage girls. But actually, the scientific evidence is that anyone could get it until age 47 to prevent cervical cancers, especially if you have never had the HPV virus. So you're starting almost afresh your life by actually then preventing yourself from ever getting that. And that's something that will be discussed on a health screening. Your type of contraception as well will be discussed there, potentially going on HRT or approaching the menopause. For gentlemen, we usually would offer testicular exams, especially if you're a young man in your 20s and 30s, you need to learn how to examine your testicles. And I tell all the gentlemen, do it on the first of the month. This way you will not forget once a month, done. After that, in your 40s, 40s are golden years for a man where the risk of testicular cancer goes really low, when the risk of prostate cancer hasn't started yet. So enjoy them, guys. Your 40s are the best years in terms of masculine health. After age 50, you need to start to think about your prostate, and that's getting things like PSA exams and sometimes um, of those horrible digital uh, exams, but not not necessarily see what the blood tests will show first, but definitely get a health checkup once a year. If you can get it on the NHS and you're in the right category, the 40 to 74 grade, if not, then I really think it's worth investing time and money on a health screening. Even if you don't go every year, go every other year. But at least you know that you've had your health checked and there might be a window that we call unconscious incompetence, which means there are areas of your health that you might not be aware that you need anything for, but you actually might. So that's the point of the health screening, things that you might be blind to and haven't seen, haven't considered, 
and then you are shown by the doctor during the health checkup. So I really like health checkups. Occupational health is a major topic. Obviously, we all need to earn a living, which is why we work and we also possibly want self-actualization and um, social role. So in terms of occupational health, most of you will probably be in desk jobs. Just be careful in terms of posture. My advice to everyone on a desk job is to stand up and stretch in between clients, in between patients, in between uh, tasks every two hours or so. Also, I would advise that you participate in a class of yoga or Pilates once a week or once every other week, but just so you're doing something for your back because this posture here, the desk job posture isn't healthy. And if we're spending eight, nine, 10 hours a day of that, five days a week, possibly sometimes longer. I now have some clients in banking and law and they think, my God, I think I work long hours as a doctor. <laughs> These guys really do work really, really long hours. Yes. So yeah, desk job people, yoga or Pilates is your best friend. Eyes, if you're working with VDE, which is vis visual display equipment, such as computers, which most of you will be, have your eyes checked once a year or once every other year. I just think it's worth a visit to the optician, get the spec saver, so pay the 18 pounds and get your eyes checked because of the use of uh, computers. Travel is possibly not as applicable now in COVID times, but if you are a frequent traveler due to work, please create a routine for yourself. Don't li live off hotel foods and airplane foods because that's why a lot of say my clients, for example, especially pre-COVID, used to say this was one of their problems in terms of keeping weight off because when they travel, they are in a different time zone, they eat whatever, so they can't keep a healthy diet. So I always say, create a contingency plan of something to do for your health whilst you are traveling. Say, this is what I do, this is what I don't do. Create almost like a health identity. These are foods I eat, these are foods I do not eat. These are exercises I will do no matter where I am in the world. No equipment exercise in your room, for example, from YouTube classes. That creates a certain routine that you will do either way, no matter where you are. There are risks specific to the particular job. Um, this usually I would say your local occupational health department should um, address with you. That's, for example, like people working night shifts and the disturbance to sleep potentially disturbance to fertility as well, because your hormones don't work as well if you're working night shifts. People working in healthcare, there's the risks of catching infections. Make sure you are up to date with your hepatitis B boosters. And then there's, of course, people are working with radiation or lead, or, but there's so many others. This is a whole occupational health curriculum. If you think your job is exposing you to a particular risk specific to that job, please speak to occupational health. Otherwise, the big ones that apply to all of us are usually stress, desk job, eyes, and potentially travel for those who do. Nine is social health. Make sure you have a good support bubble, some close relationships and healthy ones, not toxic ones. If you have toxic people in your life, get rid of them. It isn't worth the stress and the damages they are going to cause to your health. Toxins, alcohol, the UK recommended is no more than 14 units a week. If you are not certain about how to calculate units, there is a website called drinkaware.co.uk and that will help you calculate your units and ensure you are not above the recommended. Uh, if you're one of those people who once they start, they can't stop, make sure that you have some green days and red days because this way you have days that are a complete break because if once you start, you can't have only one drink, you cannot control it. Because one drink, for example, one glass of wine is already two units. So if every time you drink, you have to have three or four glasses, then one of the solutions for you, because I'm being realistic here, I cannot tell you to stop drinking altogether. One of the solutions for you would be to have green days, which is drink days, and then red days, which is no-go alcohol for you on those days. Caffeine. Uh, the recommendation is the less the better, but what I would say is my, my rule of two, which is no more than two a day and no later than two o'clock in the afternoon because some of it stays in your system up to 12 hours later, it's still in your body and 
that's not great because it will disturb sleep. And we have already learned that sleep is important for regenerative health, anti-aging, weight control, mental health, brain concentration. So we definitely want to sleep well at night. Tobacco is a no-go. There is no benefit at all in tobacco. There is no minimum consumption of tobacco that is acceptable. Tobacco is dangerous for our heart, for our lung, and is pretty much now something of the past. I rarely see now people who still smoke it, but occasionally still do, which is unfortunate. I think there's been enough done on public health campaigns, and unfortunately, it's still amongst us so for that that unfortunately i can't help you only you can help yourself because there's no minimum requirement there's only stop for that and now this concludes gets to the end of this presentation i have lots of other specialist slides on say stress and mental health and sound psychological therapies mindfulness resilience journaling affirmation healthy relationships everything we talked about i've got a little more on it if anyone wants to learn a bit more you can contact me this is some resources for self-help and they've put some apps in there that might help us Syncturation, can modify gza and headspace and i've discovered now a new one after i've done this presentation called mind shine and i love it so much <laughs> thank you this is how you can contact me if you want to know anything more about anything else and i am now going to open the floor for the, if you can ask me in the q a section here i believe i'm still sharing the screen so can you see this if you can answer me some questions there that would be great and i am happy to answer them there we go oopsie daisy Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Can you hear you well? Hello, all. Good evening. No questions? Okay, I'll wait. Let's see if anyone writes anything there. Ah, Q&A one. Any advice on supplements and how effective is CBT? Both actually excellent questions. So supplements came first and then I'll answer the CBT. I'm just going to write them down in case I lose them on the computers. Yeah. Supplements. Emily, yeah, supplements will actually depend depend on um, the, the person's health and well-being. For example, if you are a man over 40, the uh, focus should be cardiovascular health, which is uh, for a man of that age, you should be focusing on things like preventing heart attacks or strokes, ensuring uh, your cholesterol is low. If you are a young woman, it depends on your reproductive goals. If, for example, you want to be pregnant in the near future, or you want to preserve fertility, or you want to um, you want to freeze your eggs, for example, then one of the best supplements for you would be the coenzyme Q10. The coenzyme Q10 is one of the best vitamins out there that are supplements that are present out there. It's helpful for regeneration of anything. So it's good for regenerating our skin, making us look healthier and look younger. It's good for people who have just had a heart attack because it renews the cells in their heart that they have lost. It's good for women of reproductive age to renew our eggs, especially if you're going to go for a procedure like egg freezing or you're trying for a baby, you want to regenerate the maximum number of eggs to be the healthiest and youngest possible they could be. So in that case, things like CoQ10 are best. If you are actually trying for a baby, for example, right now, then I would say a multivitamin that might, must actually contain folic acid and vitamin D. The reason for that is that these are very important for the baby's brain development and the spine development. So it depends from person to person. If you are a young woman with heavy periods, then it might be a good idea to take iron supplements. If you are tired all the time, I would say uh, multivitamins with iron will be useful, but not if the iron is causing constipation. So the supplements, it's a 
very important question because I don't know many people who don't take them. My sister works in banking and she tells me that every desk, almost all of her colleagues have some form of supplement. So which one is best, which one is actually a good one. The one I use for me is one that's from Inisa, which is a, I'm going to write this uh, on the messages here so everyone can see, Inisa Advanced Multivitamins. There is also another one called Barefoot Nutrition that does a very good supplement. I use their magnesium. Magnesium is great for uh, uh, mental health and uh, sharpness, especially. So I'm going to write this one there as well. Pregna care is for people who want uh, for who want um, optimum fertility and female health. If you're trying for a baby, then definitely please take pregnant care. There is also pregnant care for men. So it's actually for both partners to fortify their ability for fertility. In the winter months, it might be worth taking vitamin C and zinc. I think that's always wise to prevent things like colds. Having said that, this year we haven't seen many colds or influenzas possibly because we've all become much better with hygiene and we're washing our hands and we're wearing masks and we're practicing social distancing. So I am in a way, I think it's one of the looking on the positive, obviously it's not been a good year, the year of the Corona, but I think at least if this is came out of it, the fact that people have learned to practice hygiene and actually we have far less of the viruses in winter, then that's great. I've never seen, I've been a doctor since 2007 and GP since 2013. And I've never seen a year like this year in terms of like the winter viruses and influenza. It's been actually a great year because people are not, you know, hugging and kissing and not wearing masks and coughing and sneezing on each other's faces. So yeah, winter months, vitamin C and zinc. I hope this answers the question on supplements. So next is Amjad, who is telling us how effective is CBT? Amjad, this is a really, really good question. I'm going to drink some water because I'm going to talk so much now. CBT, for people who don't know, is cognitive behavioral therapy and is actually a very effective form of therapy for two reasons. One is the short term effect. CBT seems to actually, there is plenty of research evidence to show that it actually works very well on thoughts and that CBT actually can give you results within six to 12 weeks, which I know it sounds like a long time, but actually for therapy and mental health, because it takes a long time to damage our mental health, it also takes a long time to restore it completely. So CBT to work in six to 12 weeks and see results is actually amazing. Another thing that governments and therapists love it and the reason you can get it on the NHS is also one that people feel better quicker and everyone wants quick results and two it means the patient starts to feel better sooner hence anything that is serious or dangerous such as prevention of suicide also happens earlier so it's almost like an semi-emergency um intervention it definitely works very well and is the gold standard for anxiety and stress and any thought processes there is also uh good evidence for it for depression but i have a different professional opinion on that i think cbt is definitely gold standard and the best thing on earth for anxiety and stress ocd conditions like that that involve thought processes. Depression is a bit more complex because it's both thoughts and emotions. And I think if there is something, oh, my timer lights. Come on. Depression is a little more complex because if there is emotions that haven't been sorted, such as the depression is provoked by complex emotional trauma from childhood, that's not gonna go with just CBT, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy which means works on cognition so thoughts to affect our behavior and that's the type of therapy we need something more on emotions like schema therapy but the problem with schema therapy and and advanced psychotherapies like that is that they can take up to 18 months to see a real difference so you start to already feel better but you can imagine if something's going to take 18 months 
in fairness, it's to correct things that you've been living with for 30 or 40 years. I think it's actually a short time in terms of therapy and is highly effective for emotions. Anything to do with abandonment issues, entitlement, people pleasing, choosing always the wrong partner, feeling not good enough, defectiveness, shame, imposter syndrome. For all these things, schema therapy is superior to CBT, but it does take time can be like a year to 18 months. Whereas with CBT, you start to feel better quicker because your thoughts have changed because it's easier to change thoughts than it is to change emotions. So in a nutshell, is CBT effective? Very, very effective. It depends who you ask. If you ask a lot of CBT therapists, they tell you, yes, the evidence for CBT is amazing, but I don't think it's the only therapy on earth. And I think there is other modalities of therapy that work for different things because mental health isn't to one size fits all. But CBT is a good place to start. For people with anxiety disorders, it will probably be the first and last place because the anxiety will simply vanish and evaporate with the CBT. The more you have, the better. For people with depression or emotional health issues if you have cbt any helps but it doesn't get rid of the problem please don't despair because sometimes that's what i see where a lot of people come back and say i've been going to my therapy sessions i didn't get better i'm a lost cause nothing will ever happen to me i am going to stay depressed all my life i'm useless and it's not actually that it's just that this therapy wasn't the right therapy for you yeah, so next, Natalia says, love your spirit, energy, and professionalism. Thank you so much. I must leave now. Oh, regards from the Netherlands. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the lovely comments. What keeps me going. Wonderful. Can we have a copy of the presentation? Yes, of course. Amjad, message me, and I will send you the, uh, yeah, I will send you the slides indeed. Just make, if you share them or use them for anything else, please just credit me just for copyright reasons. That's good. And then someone has asked what I thought about, I think, hypnosis. Where's the hypnosis question? Yeah, someone has asked about hypnosis. Um, I'm not certain because I'm a Western medicine doctor, obviously qualified from Newcastle University and then the Royal Colleges. Hypnosis is considered more of an alternative therapy. So some things that don't basically have proof behind them and are not evidence-based medicine cannot be proven by research or haven't had enough research to prove them. I can't comment on because it's not part, it's same as naturopathy or herbalism. I can't comment on things like back flowers or so because simply I don't have enough information. They are not, alternative therapies are not accepted in Western medicine, not out of snobbery or lack of acceptance, but simply because since we cannot prove them, they cannot be part of our school of thought, which is evidence-based medicine because there's no evidence they work. But this isn't the same as it's an evidence for not working. We simply don't know, but they might as well be they might be good. We don't know at all. Yeah. Amjad, can you see my uh, contact uh, details? So you can send me this request. I'll send you the presentation. I'll share the screen. So you can see if anyone else as well wants the uh, slides. So this is the... Okay. Yeah, these are the contact details. Yeah. That's the email, that's the Instagram page, the LinkedIn and the Facebook page. Uh, bear in mind, sometimes it's not always me, but I will always get uh, the message. Sometimes you might get my personal assistant, Hattie, who is actually lovely. Sometimes you get another lady as well, Fernanda, and they're both uh, wonderful. What is... Mm -hmm. Okay. Done. Answered. Anyone else has any other questions? No?
Now, let's see, we have one here. Yes. Let's see, I'm getting notifications. I think if we don't have any further questions, then I am uh, happy to end now. And it's been so nice having you all here. I hope I have not missed anything. I think, yeah, all questions have been answered. Thank you so much for everyone who participated. And I would hope to see you soon, hopefully in some live events for those of you who are in London, those who are not, it's been such a pleasure uh, meeting you today. Thank you for uh, coming in. I am going to end the webinar now. Good night.